Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. I just want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. May your DAWs be full of great cheer and awesome tracks and the finest of beats. And I am super grateful for everybody that has supported the podcast. Right now, you're listening to a Bing Crosby remix that I made a while ago because I love Bing Crosby around Christmas, and he's the man. So I remixed this track and spent about 20 minutes on it. Uh, Also, fun fact, because we are all in the season of spending money, if you decide that you want to step up your Ableton Live skills, maybe you want to learn some more tips and tricks and things, maybe you're new to Ableton, or maybe you need some more guidance on how to improve your mixing, maybe you want help on your own projects, I would be more than happy to help you out. I have taught a lot of artists how to take their music from the studio to stage, and I would love to help you as well. So if you want to save some money, I'm doing a 15% off my Ableton Live training membership. Just depending on the plan you pick, you can access all of my courses and webinars teaching Ableton Live and music production. And if you join the pro plan for $100 a month, minus 15%, then you will be able to have personal help with me. I will meet with you once a month, face to face, and help you on your projects, whatever that may be. So if you're interested in checking that out, go to liveproducersonline.com. Today we have a great episode with the bass music producer, Kermode. He is a Vancouver educator and music producer. Uh, He produces a lot of future bass, electro funk kind of stuff, which I'm really into. He has a newer track called Run Wild, which we'll listen to in a second. And his credits include teaching at SAE Institute Vancouver. Uh, He's done some stuff with Warp Academy, and he plays uh, a lot of different music festivals, including uh, Shambhala Fest. So welcome him to this episode. And here's one of his newer tracks called Run Wild. been a minute yeah. yeah that's crazy you've been in it for a long time it's been a while dude yeah. a lot of late nights staring at a computer screen <laughs> yeah i think i'm coming up on my ninth year soon yeah. it's nine years of ableton live what version did you get into when you first started eight yeah uh, eight and specifically okay. light ableton light yeah me too yeah. <laughs> same, same. Yeah. that's yeah dope. that is a good time so you were probably like one of the early adopters of the push Believe it or not, I got into the push uh, kind of late, and then yeah. it was so late that it was almost awkward to use because I'm I'm very like uh, audio based in the way I work, and I yeah. find that push is really good for MIDI, but it, so I find it kind of uh, slows me down a little bit. So I never yeah. got super into it, though. Uh, the SAE does have a bunch of them, and mm-hmm. uh, I do kind of have to know it, but I don't. I actually don't go super deep into it. No, I'm this. I'm kind of the same way. It's like I use it for what I want to use it for, even though you yeah. could use it for so many different things. Yeah, but, exactly. But yeah, dude. So, like, tell me more about how you got started with producing in the first place, like growing up with music and stuff. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, music. You know, my, being a musician was never something that was always necessarily part of my life. I actually got into like being a musician quite late in life, not till I was 19, but. Music was always around me, like um, my family, especially, and my dad, especially, always had like a super eclectic taste in music. And he was always playing, you know, like metal when my mom wasn't around. And when my mom wasn't around, he'd play like Celtic music or uh, other types of music. So, you know, there was always music on in my house. And some of my oldest memories with music are, are dating back to, you know, my dad's CD collection and listening to his music. And it was only as I kind of got into high school that I really started exploring it myself. Like I I didn't really have a taste in music in elementary school, even though I thought my friends that did were super cool. Um, But high school, I started listening to music and digging through my dad's CDs. And I kind of got into sort of metal and rock and roll uh, early high school. Same. Um, Like System of a Down, kind of more mainstream stuff. 
Those guys yeah. are wild. Dude, they're so good. I'm, I'm still bummed I haven't seen yeah, them live sure. yet. Um, yeah. And then, are, they still, are they still around? Are they still playing? I think there was a recent announcement they were going to do another tour, but they, hadn't, they haven't done something in a long time. I know they, they did tour in in uh when i was in high school like they did kind of like a final yeah. tour yeah and they came through vancouver and i remember I, I ended up getting grounded for something and i wasn't allowed to go <laughs> it's like no i know it was bum the greatest bummer. struggles of adolescence right there yeah right there. and then um it wasn't until kind of like the tail end of high school uh that i really got into wanting to make music and so it was kind of the last few years of high school is right when Skrillex was sort of getting big and kind of that American dubstep sound was getting really big. And uh, being in kind of like grade 11, 12, I don't quite remember me and my friends discovering it for the first time, we would come to school and we'd share it with each other. And and that to me was kind of my first almost experience and like, like what I like to call like DJing in a way where it's, you collect all this music and you show it to people. And I remember me and my friends, we'd come to school and like, see who had the coolest drop. And I remember like, that's when someone showed me Cohen Sound. Um, oh yeah, Mr. Yeah. Brown. Dude, like that. you're bringing me back right now. I did a like a drum cover to all these names you're dropping right now. And really? Oh yeah, that was the highlight of of early college days, late high school for sure. That's yeah. tight. Yeah, yeah and, and and so we we shared all this music, and then I remember this one specific day. I was out, my a buddy of mine in high school, Ethan. He uh, showed me Wild Style Method by Bass Nectar, and I remember that for me was like the pinnacle of anything I'd heard so far. I was just so stoked on that song. Yeah. And so I'm exploring all this bass nectar, exploring all this bass nectar, uh, getting into him more than anyone at that time. And then in 2011, he did a tour through Vancouver. Like he brought his stage show and it was 16 up, I believe. And I, I think I was 16. So this is like my first kind of real concert on my own that I, that I'd gone to. I think I'd gone to, with my dad to a couple things when i was younger but this is my first yeah yeah my my dad's awesome but then this was like the first kind of real show and i remember going being absolutely blown away by everything you know the music how physical bass music was how people reacted to it seeing everyone just ecstatic uh, the energy and after that i pretty much went home i googled like how does bass nectar make music or perform and ableton came up that that's kind of when i first started digging into ableton and and yeah. learning about ableton and wanting happily to ever it. after after that right yeah exactly yeah. like i have not looked back since it cool it, it was kind of a an amazing time in my life yeah no i had a lot of similar inspirations like when dubstep first started becoming mainstream it's like how are they making all this crazy noises like how is how are all these sounds coming out? How do they do that? So I did some research too, and I was like, "What is Skrillex using? What are all these guys using?" Because I was really like super heavy into bass music at that time. It's funny you mentioned going to see Bass Nectar at a show because it was probably yeah, it was probably ten, maybe eleven years ago. I saw him at a warehouse in Wisconsin, and like nobody really? Really knew, nobody really knew who he was, and. And it was probably like, I don't know, a bunch of like 18 year olds, 16 year olds, like crammed in this big empty warehouse. There was probably like 100 people there. And everybody's like, this is so good. I was thinking to myself as I was leaving, I was like, you know, I bet he'll be kind of big someday. Yeah, <laughs> so, ah, that's nice. now he's like residency, a lot of big festivals. But you make a lot of like future based bass music, too. And like I was listening to um, one of your newer songs called Run Wild. Yeah. The sound design on that is beautiful, man. I love that. Thank you. Love that track. And uh, it's a collab. How do you pronounce the name? Somebody I wish I knew how to pronounce it. Too. <laughs> it's, it's funny you say that. And he's a co-worker of mine. I see him every day. And he, oh, or not every day, every day I go to work and he's told me how to pronounce it. I still yeah. can't, but. Just don't share this podcast. Episode, yeah, exactly. Right? Hopefully he doesn't know. see this. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, it's like K V Z K Y. You tell I me. know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Kazki Kazki. Yeah, yeah, we'll I'm go with that. Sure. Yeah, the song's called Run Wild. It's really dope. That's um actually partially how I found you. I think it was in my Discover Weekly Spotify playlist. Oh, no way. That's awesome. And I was like, this song's dope. And then um I was looking at Warp Academy's videos on YouTube and you popped up in one of your videos. And I was like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. It was you did awesome. um like a serum walkthrough. 
on how to use Serum and uh, had some really cool like ideas for messing with the macros and things like that and automation and messing with the wavetables and uh it was yeah it was good i was like I, maybe i have this guy on the podcast he knows what well it's good that, that, that means uh the videos are and music are reaching out the way i want it to so yeah <laughs> totally man yeah i've been trolling youtube for a while looking for new ableton stuff so um but you also you started uh like a weekly episode called kermode cast is that yeah. still going on uh, it is, but it, it's unfortunately kind of gone, uh, to the back burner a little bit. Originally, uh, it was supposed to be, yeah, like a weekly podcast where mm -hmm. at first it was going to be me just kind of talking, venting about life and just, you know, talking for an hour. It wasn't even supposed to be guests because I was really inspired by comedians like Chris D'Elia and Theo Vaughn and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I realized kind of quickly that me not being a comedian just talking for an hour it wasn't really a, a, a good format <laughs> so right. then yeah so then i recently had a guest and a friend of mine sam winter and i haven't done one since and it's not that i don't want to um i just find sometimes i get in this kind of like creator mode where i'm like i want to make podcasts i want to make tutorials i want to do all this stuff and then I get in this music mode and I usually find they aren't super harmonious. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so sometimes I'm just like writing for weeks and I don't even look at Facebook and then yeah. vice versa. Type of thing. Totally, man. I, th I think a lot of people who end up starting to make music as a profession at some point and also as an educator has to be really good at balancing their time. Mm -hmm. And just what I've seen, like a lot of Ableton certified trainers I've met you know, I'm always asking like, when are you putting out new stuff? And a lot of times the answer I get is like, well, I have to finish this course first or I have to finish this mm -hmm. other thing. You know, got to pay the bills and it's nice to eat more than Cheerios, you know, <laughs> yeah. the week and may pay the bills however you got to. Definitely. And, and it is a balance for sure. But yeah. I find I'm kind of sometimes selective with my time and I, I usually try to prior prioritize music over everything other than maybe yeah. like health yeah. and family time that's about yeah. it <laughs> well i mean like and that's your passion that's what you love to do and you're talented like i like your music it's cool how did uh how did kermode get started um so it, i guess kind of an extension of the kind of the base nectar story so it was kind of high school and i remember i was telling my mom like oh, I'm, I'm kind of getting into music now and i'm thinking about producing and it was also the end of high school so it was kind of around the time that I was trying to figure out, you know, am I going to go to college? What am I going to do? And my parents were really adamant about me getting schooling. And uh, I, the only thing I was really passionate about at that time was music. Like being a high school student, I didn't really have many other interests. Like I'd play video games, I'd hang out with people. But music was kind of the first thing I felt I kind of gravitated toward and like really was obsessive over. Yeah. So... I kind of just decided to go full tilt into it and decided like, I want to start a project. I want to create music. I want to perform. I want to kind of achieve some semblance of what Bass Nectar does. At least that's what I was thinking then. And I started honestly, almost before I could produce, <laughs> like brainstorming a project. Because yeah. I, always, I always liked the artists I found that did have this kind of just like collective branding vibe storytelling thing. So I, I really was thoughtful about, you know, what did I want to produce and all these things. And back then, uh, the music I was mostly listening to as I was kind of graduating high school was more on the like psychedelic end of bass music, like nice. Tipper style yeah, yeah. stuff. And so Kermode, uh, it's a species of, uh, black bear in British Columbia, where I live, that's white and it's known as the spirit bear. And me, cool. you know, being really into kind of nature and psychedelic music and like the beauty of British Columbia, I really thought that that bear kind of encapsulated everything I love about home and like yeah. where I was in my life. So I kind of imagined this spirit bear being the Kermode, um being what kind of represented the the project and it's kind of evolved over time like and, and we can always get into that but at first it was more just around nature and nice. british columbia and and all that so the project was really just uh, me wanting to do something with my life and music being the thing 
And then yeah. going from going from there, if I'll, I'll just keep going because I, I think this yeah. part's funny. Is graduating, you know, I had to decide what I wanted to do for school. Right. So uh, I kind of lied to my parents in a way where I told them like, oh, I should maybe go to like a recording school. Like maybe I could learn about recording and sound design for movies and all mm -hmm. these things. But really, and I don't know if I admitted it even to myself back then. All I wanted to do was produce and tour and perform. And right. I right. kind of sold them on the my plan B as the plan A. Um, <laughs> right. And I think I think they finally kind of come to terms that <laughs> well, that's good. That's, that's not that's the good. case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you're teaching some stuff right now at SAE Institute, right? Yeah. SAE. What, what courses are you teaching there? So I come in, in Vancouver, by the way, right? Yeah, this yeah. is North Vancouver SAE, which used to be uh, called Harborside Institute of Technology, which is actually where I went to school. So that's actually when I graduated high school and I went to school. It was Harborside, and then I left. I graduated, did my stuff for a few years, ended up reconnecting with them, and then they actually brought me in to do like a lesson on my live sh live show, and that nice. went really well. And they kept having me back, and now I come in relatively regularly. So primarily, I teach uh, synthesis there actually. So okay. term two for students uh, is all synthesis in terms of the electronic music. Uh, portion of the course nice um so i teach everything from subtractive to fm to wavetable and sound design but then i also come in sometimes to substitute for the term ones which is just beginner ableton mm -hmm. just learning how to use the program how to pretty much just from the ground up like if you've never used ableton to figuring out how to do it and right. then i also sometimes do term three stuff which is mixing and mastering and audio engineering so almost all in the electronic music realm mm -hmm. and almost all to do with Ableton or some small extension of Ableton. Nice. Yeah, man, I could seriously talk about synthesis for hours. Dude, on yeah. And yeah, you'd be trying to get off the podcast and be like, Dan, I got stuff to do. <laughs> you just nerd out all day. What's well, your you... favorite? I got to ask. I, I always love asking everyone what their favorite uh, synth is. Uh, hardware or software? Ooh, let's do both. One, one of each. Okay. okay, good, good. Um, well, sitting right next to me is my baby. Her name is Maggie. She's a sub 37. Maggie. Ooh, nice. Yep. She's my girl. And then uh, software. I. It's hard, man. I would have to probably say I've been really having a lot of fun with the mini Moog uh, oh, or cool. the mini the mini V3 by Arturia. Oh, yeah. cool. I've never That's, played around with that. That one's really fun. The mini V3 or the Profit. Um, or I'd have to say Serum. That's just like the default, nice. really. Yeah. What Serum's about amazing. You? It is. Um, it? Yeah, I, I love Serum. I, I tried really hard to get into um, Faceplant. Uh, when, yeah, when I haven't the with Faceplant. So Faceplant's a new synthesizer that it does a bit of everything. Like it, It's kind of like Serum where it's built upon Wavetable, but it's also got a sampler in it. So it can do subtractive really well. But I think the uh, kind of the selling point of phase plant is that it can have like 32 oscillators and like crazy amount of effects wow. and modulators and then they all can modulate each other at audio rate so if you really like like modular synthesis where you're modulating things at audio rate you can do that really easily and really well in phase plant it's really cool like it's actually a really cool synth. I, yeah um but i i've I kind of haven't been able to get a really good sound out of it yet. I don't know why. Okay. I'm just so much faster in Serum. So yeah. I keep going back to it, even though I would argue Faceplant it has, is, has even more features and capabilities than yeah. Serum. Um, like you can even use Serum wavetables in the wavetables part of Faceplant. So if you have like all your old wavetables, you can just import them. Uh, so it's really cool, but uh, I'm still I still love Serum. And then in terms yeah. of hardware, I actually have unluckily never had much hardware. I I really wanted to build a modular rig for a long time. Yeah, and I had uh, the Lifeforms SV1, which was a semi-modular kind of subtractive all-in-one okay synth. 
Yeah. And it was fun, but I never dove too deep into it. And then for financial reasons, I had to sell it a while ago. Yeah, um, we've so all been I, there at some point. Yeah. So my hardware experience is unfortunately quite limited. Well, um, one of my good friends, he's an Ableton certified trainer. Uh, he is a modular wizard. I feel like nice. you guys would be good friends. His, uh, his name is Ricky Graham, and he started the company Delta Sound Labs. Uh, oh, and cool. he, yeah, if you ever decide to build a custom modular rack, he might be the guy to talk to. He makes some crazy good stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to him. It's definitely something I want to build over the course of my life, but I know it's going to be just like a, a steady climb one module at a time. Oh, one. yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, it's an expensive hobby, for yeah. sure, to say the least. Yeah. So what about your live setup? Like when you're performing, I think I saw I saw a video of you rocking the APC 40, which is yeah. like my baby. I love that thing. I don't go any anywhere without it playing live. Yeah, same. So uh, I'm I'm pretty much exclusively on the APC 40. I've never learned turntables, even though my manager always wants me to. Um, yeah. And and I've also never built upon the live show just because it's been so efficient. So. Um, kind of shortly after I graduated from SAE, I turned 19 or, or Harborside back then I turned 19 and I made my way into kind of promoting for shows. And luckily I, I got a booking, you know, relatively early on, like six months after graduating, nice. but I had no live setup at the time. And I was still really interested in, you know, what Bass Nectar was doing. And upon a little bit of research, I found out he was using uh, a variant of like the Ill Gates template. Uh, uh, really? I, yeah. And I, yeah. I don't know, or at least he used to. I, I don't know what he does now. I don't know if you know Ill Gates and his oh, template. Yeah. Oh, I've, I met him. He came through Indy a couple of months ago. I've been actually uh, meaning to have him on the podcast in the near future. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, he's, he's a great dude. I love his hair. I love everything about it. He makes really good tutorials and packs yeah. and like that. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. I'm actually going to shortly start uh, working for the Dojo, Producer Dojo, his company. Oh, right on. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a great team of people. Yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked. I'm going to come on as like a sensei there as a teacher. Congrats, um, dude. That's huge. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I'm really stoked. But um, yeah, taking a step back, uh, Ill Gates, he had this old kind of template that he would sell, or I think he helped design for Bass Nectar. And it's essentially based around clip packs. So in Ableton, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, when you drag multiple clips out of Ableton and just into the browser, it condenses it into just like one track and then like one file name. And then right. when you drag it in, it re-expands it. So I kind of took that aspect of what he was doing. I didn't really grab anything else from the template. Um, I built my own from the ground up, but it's very similar where it's kind of clip based. So I, I'm essentially DJing, but instead of my time being spent beat matching, uh, like on turntables, mm -hmm. my time's more spent triggering and rearranging loops and kind of coming up with more creative ways to get through the music and mm -hmm. to loop ideas. And yeah. I've just loved it since i first started doing it like i love that it's tactile in the way that i'm triggering clips totally um i love the possibilities in terms of preparing interesting loops or stems and yeah. i've always loved the results and even though people are like you should use turntables because it's more convenient and you're just djing anyways yeah. i still really love the result totally. i get from Ableton and an APC. And yeah. I don't think I could achieve it through turntables. I really don't. And I just yeah. love what I'm doing. That's awesome, man. That's great. And if it works for you, it works for you. And honestly, yeah. you, have, you have way more creative control, obviously, using Ableton Live. So yeah, even, exactly. even if you are still DJing, like the reality is anybody else out there in the crowd is going to have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if it makes you feel more inspired in the moment, I feel like people will feel that. You know, and it, yeah, and I, I've good. always kind of been a believer that it's more about the end result. And if people want to argue over turntables and what's the best, most official way to perform, they can waste their time arguing. I'm having fun. Yeah, I really like the result. I think the right. crowd has always liked the result, and yeah. and the way it's set up too, like with the clip clip pack method. Um, so can, I can can you nerd out a little bit about that? If we just describe it. Obviously, it'd be easier like if everybody listening could see this on a screen. That would be ideal. But like in a basic form, can you just explain what that looks yeah. like? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. So it takes a lot of prep and, and the prep is kind of where most of the work comes from. So I'll kind of explain that first is, so I run all my music through Melody, uh, not Melodyna, Mixed and Key. And yeah. so I can, you know, find out 
tempo key really quickly, drag it in. And I, I'm talking about using other people's music. My own music's another story, but uh, mm -hmm. with other people's music, drag it into Ableton in just a separate session. Mm -hmm. uh, warp, warp it into time, which doesn't take long. If you know the tempo, you can just type in the segment BPM. It takes like a few seconds to right. really line it up. And then, or maybe a minute. And then from there, I create different uh, clips in session view for the different sections. So the intro would have a start point in a clip. Um, the buildup would have a start point. The chorus or the drop would have a start point, the breakdown. And mm -hmm. so I end up having like five to eight different clips of different uh, such a cue points in a song mm -hmm. all stacked in session view. On one track? Yeah, on one track. Okay. And, and some of them will be loops. So I like to come up with loops of specific parts of the song that are really good for creative mm -hmm. purposes too, like maybe a nice vocal or something like that, maybe the beat. And then from there, if you highlight all the clips with shift and you drag it into the browser, it condenses it into one file. Mm -hmm. And from there, I kind of have a naming convention also based off Ill Gates, which I, I just label it by tempo, artist, um, song, key, and then tags. So yeah. like genre, things like that. Yeah. And then from there, what's cool about it is a lot of people that don't understand Ableton don't like Ableton sets because they don't think they're improvisational. Like they think it's like a press play, Ableton yeah. does all the work. But really what I'm doing is I'm dragging in a clip pack and then it, that would be like loading a song on a CDJ. And then I can drag in another one. So I can, at any point in a show, completely rearrange a song, completely mm -hmm. drag in a song that was unexpected. Like, mm -hmm. it gives me the ability to improvise and be very freeform while still having kind of the safety of the warping in Ableton and the stability of launching with a quantize. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's really just drag and drop and play. And, and yeah. then... I, I've also got along the bottom of my APC. And so for anyone that doesn't know what an APC is, it's a controller with a bunch of buttons and then faders and knobs, mm -hmm. you know, but for the listeners. Oh, it's great. Yeah. And so I the buttons are how I'm triggering the clips. Um, the faders at the bottom are just typical EQs. So I have like a gain, low, mid, high for one track, oh, gain, low, mid, high for the other track. So, so you, I, you MIDI map the faders as EQ. Yeah, and I, I believe cool. I use nice. EQ three or multi band dynamics. I forget right. which one has a better crossover that I like. Yeah, and um, and so that's just so instead of needing a DJ mixer, I have that ready to go. Nice. So I can even go places without a mixer, which is really nice. Yeah, and then knobs are just effects, which I tend to stay away from. Other than filters, I, I really like filtering just for getting in and out of songs. I find it oh yeah, be. The auto filter is like gold for me. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing, um, and that's primarily it. That, that's really what I'm working with. And then, uh, actually, one other thing I should say too for the listeners is setting up the right warp modes. Really important too. I think uh, one thing that really ruined the quality of my sets back in the day is I would actually use complex mode on almost everything. And okay. all the clips, and I, I, so I didn't use Complex Pro instead. Or? No, I, now I actually use uh, Beats Mode. Really? Um, okay. So, so Complex and Complex Pro. The second you stretch a piece of audio, it gets really phasey, mm -hmm. which with top end is usually pretty fine, right. although it's still kind of noticeable. Yeah. But on the low end, it it yeah. absolutely the artifacts really it. come out. Yeah. Yeah, and and I wasn't really a fan of that. Um, so beats mode, the reason I like using beats mode is you know, when you're working in transient mode, it, it preserves the audio in the sense that it plays it at its original speed and original fades. And there might be little gaps in time, but as long as I'm not slowing down a song, you're not going to hear it. Um, like you're not going to hear the little gaps in time. So it plays it back really cleanly and it cle and the subs are really clean. But if I am slowing down a song and that is going to be a problem, then I'll probably use actually like repitch mode because repitch mode is technically the cleanest uh, warp mode in Ableton. Well, well, if you have repitch mode set, you can't warp the audio clip, right? 
So that's another problem that you could run into. And yeah, as you get it, weird pitch. Yeah. Stuff. Well, and it's actually going to change the pitch of the audio too. It, exactly. That. So that could get weird as well. Yeah. So, so that's only, yeah. it's only if I'm pitching or going down a few BPM, but even then, if I'm only going down a few, usually beat smooth is the way to go because the worst thing that happens from beat mode is there's little gaps of air in between each transient. Um, which I usually don't find is too much of a problem. It sometimes actually makes the song feel a little See, techier and cleaner. That's interesting because a lot of times when I'm slowing down like a song, I use Complex Pro because I find that it allows the bass to stay more preserved. So I don't know. That's been my experience. Yeah. But, I, but yeah, I don't. I guess it just depends on the, the content that you're using and the situation that you're in too. Yeah, right? I, exactly. And, and to be fair, I, I, if the breakdown didn't have sub, I'd probably agree with you. I'd I'd probably do not complex pro, but I'm just really picky about um, the sub. It also could be the fact that like I've got clips and then the clips are going through a three band EQ and then they're going through maybe like a limiter to make sure it doesn't clip in Ableton. If you're processing a lot of stuff that could definitely (laughs) make it sound different. Yeah. 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 And then it has to go into like the house mixer. So I find like all those steps have the opportunity to degrade quality. Yeah. Yeah. So so for me, yeah. Just make sure you turn the right knob in the moment. I've made that mistake before. (laughs) Yeah. I think we all have. (laughs) Right before the drop, high pass filter. Oh, that's, yeah. I've been there. I've been there. And then try and play it in like you did on purpose. Yeah, no, it was cool. Yeah, no, that's that's normal. That's normal. Yeah, it's experimental. Yeah, as long as you're confident about it, yeah, I feel like the mistakes are fine. It's okay. I make experimental music. Yeah. Do you listen? Sorry. Do you, Do you listen to Moody Good? Uh, I haven't listened to much. No. Oh, uh, he's he's a, a really good dubstep producer. My friend showed me a track of his the other day, and the drop had no kick drum in it. It was it was like what? totally yeah. The the sub bass had enough like. Oomph, even though it wasn't an 808 it was still like a neuro dubstep bass but it had no, n- enough umph that was there was really? no kick, but it was good yeah so i, I just thinking about how, yeah yeah no music. i wonder how he did that that's interesting <laughs> he's really good uh, okay. i recommend his music great for studying engineering and sound design yeah maybe he just yeah. threw like 30 otts on the sub <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was cool so when you are dragging those clips going back to what you were saying earlier mm-hmm. how many decks are you using like obviously like track being a deck yeah Um, so so i have a a deck a and a deck b which are is what i do most of my set off of okay and then i like to bring in additional kind of layers throughout my set that usually people don't notice but sometimes it'll be like a little hype kind of vocal sound or maybe like a percussive loop that wasn't in the original song or some other layer and that is usually on a deck C, which is a lot more basic. Like my deck A and deck B have the volume and the EQs as well as all the effects connected to them. Mm-hmm. While the deck C only has, uh, I think it's just volume and EQs. And so yeah. that's just for small additional layers, but I'm, I'm actually doing almost everything off of two decks, deck A and deck B. Okay, cool. So when you're running your effects, you have them on the insert of deck A and deck B, or do you group deck A and B together? And- uh t- so i have sends for a certain amount of effects so okay. nice. reverb and delay i have sends that i go to yeah and those I are similar yeah. yeah and those are individual per track and then the f- the filters are individual per track too because i like to be able to use it to sometimes instead of using the eqs at the bottom i'll like yeah. filter out yeah uh but then there's uh, some effects that affect the master um so they're beat repeats because i really like to glitch yeah. and that, that that how i have it set up is it's uh one button to tr- so all those effects i should say the master effects they work through dummy clips in so that they only play when i'm holding down the button so that's one thing i really don't like about ableton is a lot of effects are you toggle on to turn it on yeah you toggle off to turn it off yeah which isn't very tactile so i like to press an effect and then let go and it disengages so nice. so nice. to do that everything goes to a kind of a, a in like a different track that takes the input from the other decks and then that track has dummy clips on them so the dummy okay. clips don't have any sound they're just muted clips but they exist on the track 
Okay. And what they do is when I trigger a dummy clip, it's, uh, have you ever played with the launch modes in the clips yeah. in Ableton? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, so it's on repeat. And so it's on a really small repeat, like a 64th note. And oh, so nice. as, it, as it loops that 64th note in the clip envelope, it actually turns on the effects. So the effects are nice. only on as I press the button. That's smart. And, yeah, and then the second That's it smart, releases, yeah. it releases past the looping enveloping up and goes to the off section like a 64th note later so it's really nice. quick nice that's a really smart idea yeah okay. so i so that's kind of how i do my effects so i'll have like a beat repeat where i like press to start glitching and yeah. then i'll connect that to a knob where so i'll turn it and that'll change the groove okay. so it's so fun for glitches because then i can like trigger and then like change the groove while just like twisting a knob yeah, and then yeah. let go and it goes back to normal that's perfect yeah that's, that's great man yeah, I was doing like a long workaround to doing a very similar thing where I would uh, have the macros I would use on the APC 40. I would have a audio effects rack set up and then I would basically turn the beat repeat to a certain a speed. So it'd be like quarter notes, eighth notes, 16 notes on that macro on the APC 40 map to the knobs. And then um, there's the device on off button. Oh, yeah. And so I would use that to get in and out to turn the effect on and off instead. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I do yeah. that with some effects, too, where I'm um, setting the macro ranges. Like, you know, how you, when you MIDI map, you can set a range for how the knob affects mm -hmm. something. Yeah. I, I set the device on and off just to be zero to one. So when the, the knob is completely to the left, the rack's completely disengaged. So yeah. all my so none of my stuff's running through effects. Right. And then the second I start to engage like a filter, the second I start to turn the filter, the the MIDI mapping goes into the range of the device being on nice. and then toggle left and then nice. turns off type of thing. Yeah. Anybody who's like brand new to Ableton Live, stop listening right now. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm totally into it. It's fine. It's great. Yeah. So that's like a lot of live stuff. Let's go mm -hmm. back to like maybe the studio producing wise. Cool. What, yeah. are, what are some of your favorite, like always go to Ableton stock devices that you use? Ooh, in your stock. Tracks? And what do you uh, use them for? So I'll start with instruments. Uh, do it. I always use Sampler. Sampler is one of my favorite it's devices. Fun. It's a fun one. Yeah. Until recently, I was, I was really into kind of the neuro-esque style of sound design where you would make like a really long kind of heavily processed sample and then you would throw that into sampler to trigger and re-manipulate and trigger with MIDI. And I was really into that for years, like years until really recently. And then I was pretty much using sampler all the time then for my bass work. So all my bass work would be throw a bass and sampler, trigger it, throw a yeah. bass and sampler, trigger it. Yeah. Um, I really love operator. I think oh, it's great. It's so clean. It it's is. so easy. Like yeah. I find for FM synthesis, things can get really complicated, really harsh, really quickly. And operator just makes it so simple, but nice. Yeah. Um, so I love operator. So, uh, so those are kind of my go-to devices in terms of instruments. Um, I don't really use too many other instruments in Ableton actually. Uh, Drum racks sometimes, though I do my drums in audio mostly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've done both. I think it's just preference. Totally yeah. Preference, and, yeah. And, yeah. And there are scenarios where I do both, like trap hats, where you want to draw lots of tiny little micro mm -hmm. amounts and easily manipulate velocity. Then, yeah, yeah. then I'll probably do it in MIDI. See, but, that's that reason alone is why I wanted to buy a push just to use the repeat button. Cause it's so fast. It's so yeah. easy just to do like fast hats and stuff. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. And I, I love seeing in like the trailer for the push people, like just quickly, like whipping in all the hats with yeah, like yeah. a little swipe of the finger. Yeah. And, stuff like that. and anybody who makes trap music's like, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, even I was like, Oh, I gotta get this. Yeah. Um, even though I never ended up. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of effects, I re I use, <laughs> believe it or not, so, you, you know, have you ever, like, ranked your plugins in Ableton? Oh, yeah, that's fun. Yeah. See how, yeah. So, utility is always my number one by a huge margin, <laughs> which, is, which yeah. is hilarious. No, I mean, utility is um, great, man. Like, it's so simple, but yet you can use it for so many different ways. Yeah, yeah. like, I, I always use it for, I mean, the volume's an obvious one. I right. love it for just easy volume automation. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
but I really like it for the mid side splitting capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So unfortunately with 10, if you're, uh, if anyone else is unaware, it doesn't just automatically split the mids and sides when you do like, when you move the wide width knob away from a hundred, now it just increases the sides or decreases it Mm -hmm. while the old version would split it. But if you right click it, if, if you right click it, it can you go to mid side mode. mode. Yeah. Well, and you can do that too. You can do split stereo mode on the track and interact that with the utility too. Yeah. And get real crazy with it. Yeah. So that, that's my main use for it because I, I really think mid side processing is mm-hmm. insanely important. Yeah. Um, I love Saturator. I think Saturator is a phenomenal yes. distortion plugin. Yes. Incredible, not only for tone, but also uh, getting the most headroom, I find. Just the it, the clip, the soft clipping feature mm-hmm. in it, amazing. I just love it. It is. Oh, totally. It's like a, everything you'd want in a compressor and yeah. in, a, in a distortion pedal because it gives you the best of both, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're I, driving that input, you're compressing the signal at the same time. So exactly like two birds with one stone and it sounds great. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And then uh, auto filter, I definitely use a ton. Like I actually don't use many other filters. Serums filters are obviously like amazing. Yeah, they're nice. But, but they're more, I use them more for the effects, like the, mm-hmm. the flanger filter and the yeah, subtle filter. movement and type of things. Yeah. Yeah. But the auto filter in Ableton, I think is, it does the job. It does. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I, I like the Ableton stock devices. The only ones I don't really use anymore are the EQ because I really like Fab Filter and Ozone and just other mm-hmm. EQs. Yeah. And um, I don't really use the reverb anymore because I, I like the convolution reverb more. And I like uh, Fab Filter Pro R a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Fab Pro R is R. legit. It really is. It sounds it's so, so amazing. Clean. It's the yeah. cleanest sounding reverb I've ever heard. It's just. Very HD, very transparent, especially for like yeah. future-based music. Yeah, and I only, I only got it, I only got it like three months ago, yeah. and just blew my mind. I just it's love nice. It. There's a lot you can do as far as just coming up with crazy effects just inside the plugin mm-hmm. with the filter and everything inside of it. I think and I just, right. I just love the like the tone, like the frequency-based decay rate, like the the blue, uh, like EQ looking thing in it, where you can make certain frequencies decay longer or shorter than others yeah like why doesn't every eq right. have that it's I'm... a nice visualizer for sure yeah, yeah. it's beautiful yeah, yeah i find i find myself with fab filter sometimes having to like fight myself from just using my eyes <laughs> because like when you can see everything and it's so pretty yeah. you know and it's like so completely like specific mm-hmm. in the visualizer it's like you gotta also trust your ears yeah way. that's yeah. true yeah yeah, their their stuff's amazing. I've been really liking that sort of um, concept when it comes to like plugins, where in Pro R you have like very frequency based decay rate, and you like click. Mm-hmm. And there's another company I really like that they only have two plugins, but they both are two of my favorite plugins now. Uh, Oak Sound, or I don't know if it's Oak Sound, but it's O A E K Sound, and they have a plugin called. Uh, soothe and they have a plugin called spiff and it's great names yeah they're great and they're very frequency based processors so spiff is a transient designer but it's not not a multi-band transient designer it's actually like a full-on frequency curve based uh transient designer where you actually turn up certain bands or turn down certain bands yeah. and that you can get so precise with I'm looking at it right now this looks pretty awesome it looks it, like fab filters cousin yeah it's, it looks like it's phenomenal and then soothe is kind like kind of like a dynamic eq but it's a lot cleaner and it, it's intelligent in the sense that it actually yeah. reads what peaks are too loud and turns it down and it can go so precise, so insane that you turn like any resonant tone out of a sound till it's pretty much noise. Like it, it's so good. Uh, so those two plugins awesome. are yeah. are two of my favorites. I know I'm kind of out of the Ableton realm. Oh now, no, but, dude, it's totally fine. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Anything music like this. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, oeksound.com. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Bill did a tutorial on Soothe, which is what first introduced me into it, and nice. I love them. They're yeah, phenomenal. Mr. Bill is a fun dude. Dude, he's, his, a, he's a wizard. His music is, I still think, what like whether you subjectively like it, I think objectively right. is some of the most technical Yes. well-produced music out there yeah. i also happen to love the music but i just even from right. a technical standpoint yeah i mean even if you don't you have to respect the sound design and like, exactly his, his knowledge in the program absolutely yeah. for sure yeah totally man and um yeah music in general i feel like you just everybody relates to it in some level and that's the cool thing is like yeah the, the thing i love about ableton live is you get to a point of where like even if you don't love the other person's music you can still meet somebody else who uses the program and you're like oh dude ableton fam you know exactly it's, like, it's a big family reunion it's like you can talk about the same stuff for hours even if you're into two totally different genres that's why i actually love teaching in a like a physical school because there's so many different types of musicians but they all are learning the same program mm -hmm. and for me i get to see so many different perspectives on the program which is really cool like how, what does a hip hop producer take away from Ableton? What does a singer take away? Right. And I, I love that too, that although people's music tastes may be completely different, mm -hmm. just the, the love of the instrument that is Ableton is yeah. universal. And right. I love that. No, that's very well said. That's the same thing I tell a lot of my students is like, you got to think of Ableton like you think of your guitar. You mm. have to practice it, you know, yeah. like you have to practice it. It's, it's an instrument in itself. Yeah, you can do more yeah. instruments with it, but it really is a, a yeah. beast of a program. But so I saw in some of your credits and things that you played, you've played some really cool music festivals like uh, Shambhala. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, I just played Shambhala this summer for the second time. How was that? Um, oh, man. Amazing. Because So, so Shambhala for me has always uh, been sort of this kind of, beacon festival in terms of goals and inspiration where yeah. again i kind of got into music before i was of age to go to stuff in canada it's uh 19 in canada to go to these large events and so when i was obsessed with bass nectar he had these videos of him performing at shambhala and i would watch them on loop and i knew like every cue every like dancer doing things like i would watch these videos and i I always kind of obsessed over Shambhala even before I had been there. Yeah. And then going there, it was totally different than what I imagined it to be, but still beautiful and incredible in its own way. And so every time I get to play there, it really feels like that kind of moment of accepting that I've actually achieved something I wanted because yeah. I find a lot of times in music, I can have a goal or a dream I achieve it and I still don't feel like I've gone anywhere. Right. Like it's really, sometimes it's hard to scratch that it yeah. should be satisfied or proud. Like, I don't know. It's a, a, something I really struggle with. Yeah. But I think Shambhala is always something where I'm like, Oh, I did it. Like I'm, I'm yeah. proud of myself for doing this totally. and, and being part of this festival. Mm -hmm. um, so it was amazing. It was, it was awesome. such a good time. The performance went well. I love the stage. I, I love everything about it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a fun festival. I haven't been, but I've seen videos and pictures. And yeah, it's it it's worth it. it. It's world renowned for a reason. It's yeah, totally beautiful, dude. Totally. That's I. The biggest festival I played was Electric Forest, and that was pretty really wild. that was pretty amazing. Right I before. really want to come down to Electric Forest. Oh, dude, it was incredible. Yeah, I played on a separate side stage, like right before FKJ. So I had a decent crowd because yeah. nobody knew who I was at that time. But like, yeah. I, I made so many friends, and it was a, a magical experience. But oh, that's sick! Yeah, dude, for sure. And like what you were saying, it's like those milestones. You know, as a as a producer, it's easy when you're like hunched over in a dark cave over your laptop for years on end, like getting to a point at some time where you're like, why am I actually doing this? Like, yeah. Who, who am I? Like, I don't even know, like, if this is good or bad. Like, should I keep doing this? Like, we've yeah. all hit that point, right? In our yeah. lives where you're, like, wanting to jump off your own roof. But, like, I think in the end of the day, um, staying true to, like, you and doing what you love. And then you mm -hmm. hit, you hit after you do that and practice so much, you, eventually it's going to, something's going to happen, right? Exactly. It's just, I really think, 
like one of the biggest pieces of advice I just always try to give people is really just patience. Like I think a lot of my friends have wanted to become producers, put in two years, realize they're not making any money. They're not making the music they want and they give up. Um, and I think it's just, it really is that patience. And before you know it, you will be playing these festivals. And I, I really think people need to kind of get their head out of the like overnight success thing. I really think right. most people, it's just a steady climb. You're yeah. never, it's like, maybe you can have these moments that push you, but sure. it's, a, it's definitely a, a slow and steady climb for sure. This is true. This is 100% yeah. true. And, and, and should, oh, sorry. I was just going to say like now is the best time ever to to make a music career without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, like you've got everything at your fingertips. You have social media that in a way that didn't exist, you know, the same way it did 10 years ago. Yeah. And reach so many people so much faster and make yeah. music and do it in an affordable way in your bedroom and make bangers that are awesome, radio worthy, you know. Yeah, and, and that's why I really have to encourage people not to get caught up in the competitive aspect because i know a lot of people yes. are like well the market's oversaturated because everyone can post and everyone can email playlists and right. that, that's very true but you still don't have the same gatekeepers you had before and you need to just not focus on that and, or or I, I i actually usually try and flip it where you know an example is uh like someone like marshmallow i'm i'm not big on his music but I actually love that he's brings so much attention to electronic music. Mm -hmm. uh, just the more people listen to his music, the more likely they are to listen to mine. And so I like to think of the oversaturation, just meaning there's a bigger mm -hmm. community. Uh, not to mention the majority right. of people that listen to, not the majority, but a large chunk of people that listen to electronic music are electronic musicians. So the more producers there are out there, the, the bigger the community, yeah. the more well, we're totally. all sharing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you think, like, two decades ago or whatever, you didn't have the ability just to send somebody else, like, an Ableton project and collab and yeah. make something in a matter of a week, you know? Yeah. And that's cool. So there's, like, new collaboration bringing people together in that sense, too. But also, yeah. like, yeah, exactly what you were saying is, uh, I think, like, a, a rising tide, like, lifts all ships is, like, a mm -hmm. quote that Ari Herstan said on the podcast recently. And I was like, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's like, it's true. Like, it, we're not in the business of competition. Like, to me, that's just, you're cutting yourself short from new relationships and new opportunities at that point. Exactly. So. Exactly. A hundred percent. The more everyone succeeds, the more likely we are and the bigger the community grows. Totally. Well, and, like, even so, like, for example... If if you wanted to come play a show in Indianapolis because it's on your tour route, you know, if you know somebody else who's like in that genre or whatever, and you're like, hey, man, I'd really love to book a show like doing show swaps is something I started doing more recently, like nice. hitting up other producers in a similar genre as my band Philia and being like, yo, you come play a show for us. We'll come play a show with you. And like that kind of collaboration, I think, is really helpful for people wanting to play out more. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. My manager actually started doing things. He, um, like that, he, he runs a club out here in Vancouver. And so he'll kind of book people that run other clubs and be like, Hey, my artist Komodi wants to play your club. Like let's do a little swap. And yeah. yeah, it's all about that collaboration. The more people in the game, the more people to work with and do things with. Right on dude. Absolutely, man. That's perfect. Well, uh, I want to respect your time and like we could probably keep talking for hours, but uh, is there anything else that you wanted to share with people um, before we sign off? I definitely encourage everybody to go check out your music. I'm going to include links in the show notes so everybody Thanks. can be able to follow you on the interweb, Instagram, all those. Yeah, places. I, I mean, maybe I'll just do a little plug. Uh, you guys can find my music on SoundCloud, Spotify, at Kermode. Uh, I do a lot of everything, sometimes feature bass, sometimes electro. I'm working on a lot of like just grimy dubstep and halftime. And that's kind of my goal for 2020 is to kind of get back into my roots, that bass nectar esque sound. Yes. Do it. Um, and uh, you can find me on YouTube, Kermode Music. And uh, that's about it. Yeah. Right on, dude. This has been fun, man. It's nice hanging out with you. Uh, yeah, this is easy. We have to do it again. Yeah, for sure. <laughs>